It's Friday, the 29th of March, 2024. This is the Pod News Weekly Review, live, live at Podcast Movement with James Cridlin and Sam Sethi. I'm James Cridlin, the editor of Pod News here in Los Angeles in California. And strangely, I'm Sam Sethi, the CEO of True Funds, also here in LA. Strangely. Yes. Um, yes, we're here for Podcast Movement Evolutions, and it's uh, all very exciting. And you can probably hear we're just sitting in the uh, speaker ready room. Uh, which is all very exciting. Anyway, in the chapters today, the Pod News report card has been unveiled. When is a listener not a listener? Pocket FM, which is an India-based audio platform, has secured $103 million in funding and... Hi, this is Gautam Rajanan, the CEO and founder of Hubhopper. I shall be on the show later to discuss the growth of Hubhopper podcasting in emerging markets. He will. This podcast is sponsored by Buzzsprout. Podcast hosting made easy with easy and powerful tools, free learning materials, remarkable customer support, and a new iOS app. Live from Podcast Movement, this is the Pod News Weekly Review. James, right, let's kick off. Uh, wonderful keynote. I'm not saying that because I'm your friend. I'm saying that because it was a wonderful <laughs> keynote. Uh, Quick highlights. What was the highlights of the keynote? Well, uh, the highlights of the keynote were obviously I was very good and very handsome and very funny. Uh, No, uh, that wasn't the highlight at all. Um, (laughs) The highlight of the keynote, I mean, really, it was two. It was well, it was three things. It was looking back at the year, looking back at um, what podcasting has uh, gone through and uh, and all of that. Then having a look at the Pod News report card, uh, which we'll get on to in just a second. And then finally, a video from Adam Curry, the podfather himself, which got a number of rounds of applause, which is uh, really good. Um, I'm imagining that uh, 80% of the people there were, oh my God, it's Adam Curry, this is amazing. And 20% of the people there were, uh, who's this man? Exactly. <laughs> rather, what, rather worryingly. And what's he talking about? And what's he got to do with... Yeah. With the, the whole podcasting thing, he invented it. That's what he's got to do with it. Anyway, that was uh, really cool. The Pod News Report card was um, really interesting. It was just um, having a look at whether um, uh, you know some of the apps have got better, some of the directories have got better, whether people had specific issues with specific apps. Apple did um, pretty well again. Um, uh, seemingly number one in most of the results, which was um, good to see. Um, lots of people moaning about the Apple ID, though, and actually the whole thing of getting a new podcast into Apple yeah, it's still it's not, it's not easy. Not easy. Um, so that was really good. Lots of um, quite negative comments about uh, YouTube. Uh, imagine my joy. I'm meeting uh, the product manager of YouTube Music at two o'clock this afternoon. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> imagine, imagine how that's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine how that's going to go down. But um, yeah, but uh, all in all, a very positive um, thing. It's um, uh, really nice to be able to take a bellwether of the industry every year. Um, and if you want to go and uh, take a peek, um, then uh, you'll find the latest uh, report card in the Pod News uh, newsletter. Excellent. Now, um, generally, how has uh, podcast movement evolution been for you this year? Yeah, it's been good. It's been um, much more positive than uh, it's been in uh, the past. I think Denver and Colorado, there was this feeling that, you know, um, sort of deer stuck in the headlights type of thing. Um, I think people understand what's going on with the industry now. I think people are comfortable about where the, where the future is going. So, yeah, so from that point of view, yeah, I thought it was, um, it's been quite positive. You've, you've been on a You've been on a stage um, having a nice, polite conversation with other people in the industry? Yeah, I think my opening line was advertising is the emperor's new clothes and it doesn't work. Mm. Yeah, that went down well, didn't it? No. <laughs> so uh, me and Rob Walsh were on a stage together, which is was a first. Um, and uh, I called out fundamentally. I th- I'm not saying advertising doesn't work. It does, right? People buy advertising and yeah. they place it in ads and they're oh, great. Well done. What I'm saying is that actually fundamentally the, the metrics and the tracking are all based on a belief system, not a known system. Like right? You don't know if I listen to the ad. You don't know how long I listen to the ad. You can't metric it and you can't measure it. So on that basis, you're just telling me that so many people listen to the whole of this podcast and please believe us that they listen to your ad. Right? And when I ask people to put a show of hands up for how many people skip past ads, fundamentally most of them did that. Right? Yeah. yeah. So... These are things that we had, but it was a lot of fun talking on stage. 
uh, the other question I asked Rob was, why isn't Libsyn supporting the podcast in Twitter own? His answer was, you're all bullies and you bully us, so I won't do it. Well, there we are. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, there we go. Anyway, uh, good. Uh, what can you say to that? <laughs> uh, not a lot, but it, we, we shook hands at the end and politely walked apart. But I don't think that me and Rob are going to be go for a drink together. Let's put it that way. No, brilliant. Oh. Now, moving on. Um, what's this, James? Spotify is now offering video courses in the UK. Yeah, I thought that this was interesting. They are offering um, video courses. So if you want to learn, I, I don't know, learn how to um, uh, be, on a, be on a panel and not have a big argument, uh, then you can uh, go, um, and then you can learn how to do that in uh, Spotify video courses. It's a new um, idea. It's only available in the UK, which is interesting. The idea is that you can watch maybe one of the courses, and then you might want to pay for the rest. Um, so it's another income stream for uh, Spotify. Uh, currently working on it. it. Looks like an interesting and good and good idea. Um, and I think you have already spotted that there's an opportunity in the podcasting world as well, haven't you? Yeah, uh, Barry at Podhome uh, and I were talking about it. Barry's got a number of uh, online developer courses that he's done through RSS delivery. Mm. And so medium equals courses was something that we added to test it. And it's part of phase seven of the podcast namespace anyway. Yeah. Um, and so we added it and it works. Um, with the value for value model, Barry set a value for what he wants as a minimum for what he wants paid. So he's not doing what I'd say with podcasting. So he's saying, yeah. I want you to pay as little as this, but you can pay more. Yeah. Um, and I think that's interesting. I was going to ask you a question there. How is Spotify charging for books and courses? Are they going through the Apple Pay model or they got their own model? Because uh, I've never really bought anything. Yeah, I believe at the moment that they chuck you out to their website and they then uh, take the payment for themselves. Right. So therefore it's not, you know, you don't pay the Apple tax, the Apple 30% tax. So I believe that that's how it works. But um, Yeah, because yeah, when I looked at the audio books, every one of the books was included with my subscription. Yeah, you get a certain amount. I think you get 30 hours or, or so included in your subscription and then you pay... For, Got it. for the additional uh, stuff. So, which, you know, I think makes uh, makes a bunch of sense. But, um, yeah, I mean, another thing that Spotify is selling, um, good news for audio, potentially, and uh, Spotify have also paid more than $9 billion to the music industry last year, they say, which is always nice to see, too. Yeah, I mean, is that, although top-end, how, how evenly distributed was that? Well, I mean, it's, we're going to the record companies, so it's up to the record companies to do a good job of passing the money on, um, of course, which uh, they may or may not do. So who knows? All right. Now, James, when's a download, not a listen? Yes, this was an interesting uh, blog post from uh, Dan Meisner, Canada's Dan Meisner, um, who doesn't like the word listener. And he believes that downloads are done by downloaders and listens are done by listeners. I think there's um, a lot of quite sloppy language in podcasting. And I think one of the things, one of the reasons why I'm very excited about um, standards and making sure that we um, use the same words to describe things as each other um, is precisely this, um, that uh, there's a lot of confusion out there with even things like a listener versus a download, let alone anything else. And so Dan um, is um, basically picking us up on some of the language that we use. And um, yeah, I think that that makes uh, a ton of sense. Yeah, I read that whole report. And the thing that I mean, I think I knew already, but worriedly, was with Spotify and Apple, anything over zero is yes. considered a listen. Well, with autoplay, when it skips onto the next track, next track, like for an episode, I might have done that by mistake, but that's now registered as a listen. That's clearly not the right thing to do, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it doesn't register as a download until you listen to 60 seconds or more. But weirdly, if you're a listener, then, um, then yes, you're absolutely right. It's, it's anybody that's listened to more than zero seconds. Um, yes, it doesn't seem to fit into the IAB definition. It doesn't seem to fit into, you know, to much. And again, this is why I think a podcast standards group is a good idea um, to just firm up some of the language that we're all using. I mean, even apart from anything else, I think um, Acast calls a... Uh, host read ad a sponsorship 
rather than a host red ad. Uh, I mean, you know, surely it makes sense for the industry as a whole to call, you know, uh, to call something the same, the same thing, um, to help advertisers, to help other people understand what's going on. Um, so I think just, you know, yeah, aligning language is, is always a good, it's always a good plan. Well, uh, Dad, if you're listening, I'd love to get you on to the Podcast Weekly Review to talk more about this. I'm sure he would be delighted to take part. Okay, uh, drink, drink. We're going to talk about AI, James. Oh, brilliant. Yes, yep. yes. Um, uh, interesting. A number of different content guidelines um, that were changed uh, this week. YouTube now requiring disclosure about the use of AI in certain circumstances. So YouTube's uh, new content uh, guidelines, very interesting. They basically say... You have to tell us if you're using AI to firstly make a real person say or do something they didn't say or do, B, alter footage of a real event or place, or C, generate a realistic scene that didn't actually occur. So if you're using AI to make stuff up, then you have to say so, um, unless it's obvious, uh, in which case you don't. Apple Podcasts also sent me an email in typical Apple form sent me an email saying, we've updated our content guidelines, gave me no further information. So of course, thanks Apple. So I have to sit there and run a diff on the previous version of the content guidelines and the new version of the content guidelines. And there's a, a few bits of uh, EU legal language in there, but um, the main change is again, um, AI. Um, so if you use AI, um, then you have to mention that. Um, it's very unclear what they mean by use AI. We use AI for, um, for some of the descriptions, potentially. And um, is that using AI? I don't know. But anyway, Apple are asking for the use of AI to be prominently disclosed in both the audio and the metadata. Um, and Apple also uh, want their transcripts to be um, you know, correct as well. Um, so yeah, a bunch, of, a bunch of AI things. I think just these companies are getting worried. Uh, this feels like uh, covering your backside because there's no way they're going to be tracking every podcast and listen to every episode. I agree. So I think this is, we told you that you couldn't do this. Therefore, when you get sued, we are not going to get sued because we warned you and said that you had to mark it and you forgot to mark it. I agree. I agree. I think, uh, I think it's a lot of legal um, backing. Um, the one conversation that I've had with someone from Apple here has been uh, around transcripts. Um, he, or indeed she, was saying that um, weirdly, um, some of the podcaster generated transcripts that are being submitted to Apple are actually worse than the automated ones that Apple would actually generate for themselves. Um, and so firstly, um, they said, stop doing that. Stop just generating automated transcripts that aren't um, that you don't actually go and check. And then secondly, I was saying, well, would it be interesting to have a tag in the podcast transcript tag to say whether or not this is completely AI auto-generated or to say whether a human has actually checked this? Right. I mean, so if I go into the Buzzsprout app and change the transcript, which I can do, then that should flag to Apple that a human has actually checked this particular, this particular transcript. And maybe if no human has bothered to actually check it, then at least Apple knows that, that you know, this is an automated transcript from the Pod News Weekly Review, for example. Um, and I shall fess up now, I don't normally check the transcript for this particular show. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. News <laughs> to me. Breaking news. <laughs> anyway, there we are. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I think transcripts will have to get better, um, but yeah, it, it's a good way to flag it. Now, moving on, James. This was a story that really flummoxed me. Yes, um, I'd not heard of Pocket FM particularly, and then when they came out that they'd raised a Series D, D, not A, of a hundred and three million dollars, not rupees. Um, I was like, wow, who the hell is Pocket FM? And why did they raise the money? Tell me more. Well, tell me more about Series D, not A. What does that mean? It's the fourth round of raising. So uh, you'd have your seed round, then you'd have your Series A. So the valuation is basically very low. You're probably in the five million valuation for the business and raise a million. 
And then as the business grows, you fundamentally are saying that we're worth more, so we're going to raise B, then C, then D. Okay. That's all it is. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, yes, it's um, it's an audio platform. Um, it uh, has audio books in there. It has uh, podcasts in there, um, various uh, other things as well. Um, it's actually raised more than 196 million so far. No. Four rounds, yeah. Yeah, which is, um, which is quite a thing. Now, interestingly, the way that it works is you buy coins and then you spend coins on the content within the app. They heard you, James, the fairground token. Well, yes, and I'm there thinking, well, that sounds interesting. Why can't we be doing that? Why can't we be, instead of talking about sats and Bitcoin and all, all of this other stuff that... Uh, quite a lot of people are quite worried about. Why can't we basically turn around and say, oh, okay, well, you, you know, it's just coins. Yeah, you could. And um, I loved what uh, Rohan Nayak, who was the CEO, said. Mm. Uh, Pocket FM's business model is microtransactions, not subscriptions. Um, and uh, what he's saying is that he's using their own coin to do what we uh, say about value for value. Yeah. Um, and what's nice about the way he's done it, he can set that coin value to anything he wants. Right? Yes, yes. Um, yes, I think that's one way of doing it. Um, so have they got away without that? Uh, uh, because Pocket FM isn't a bank, right? No. But it kind of is a bank in this particular case because... It's an in-out purchase, like a game. Right. So fundamentally, they're not saying that the coin has any intrinsic value outside of their platform. Wow. Just as buying a gun on one of the gaming platforms or a new car skin, yeah, right? Yeah. So fundamentally, there is no real value to the coin. Okay. So well, I can do that. That makes that makes sense, yes. So it's because you can't turn a coin back into money. No. Right, which of course with sats you can. So, mm. It's a very good way of doing it. I, um, I met another uh, platform that's starting to do that called Sheekonomy. Um, I don't know who's been doing that. So I think what was really interesting to me though was in the pitch deck they gave investors, they've talked about pay as you go, right? Or, and microtransactions. So clearly the investors understood the model of V for V yeah. and understood that that has long-term potential value. Mm. Otherwise you're not raising the 103 million. I don't care who you are, right? Yeah. So what really pleases me about this deal is more that it actually rubber stamps the model of microtransactions more than it does SATs, right? So yeah. Yeah. Really good deal. No, interesting. And I wonder how much of that is because it's an Indian company, because it's based in India, because it's um, because, you know, Indian uh, people are paid in slightly different ways and, and all of that. I wonder whether that particularly lends itself um, uh, to that. It wasn't the only Indian company who you have uh, ended up um, talking with. Yeah, I didn't realize this was India week. But it must have been. <laughs> <laughs> who did you end up talking with? Well, I... I I often term myself a coconut, brown on the outside, white on the inside, because I'm very culturally unaware of what's going on in India. Yeah. And so I, I picked up the phone to um, Gotham Anand, who's the CEO of Hubhopper, one of the big platforms for hosting out in India. And I wanted to know more about Hubhopper, but also I wanted to know more about what's going on in the Indian subcontinent in terms of what mobile devices, what genre of podcasts they listen to. So yeah, I asked uh, Gotham, tell me more about Hubhopper. Started about eight and a half years ago. I was actually on a very different career trajectory at the time. I was working at Barclays. I essentially thought I wanted to be a banker all my life. And this was predominantly because my entire family was from that background. And I found myself choosing possibly the most boring job within the corporate bank that I was in. As I mentioned, I was at Barclays. So I was a senior risk and research analyst straight out of college. And as you can imagine, with that kind of role, I had to spend a large amount of time on my own, copious amounts of time on my own. Adding insult to injury, what Barclays had done is they had put firewalls across most platforms that one would normally visit to bide their time and make their workday slightly more fun. So I couldn't visit all of my usual suspect platforms. And serendipitously happened upon podcasts and I'd never consumed a podcast before. And when I say I'd never consumed a podcast before, I think I can speak for the entire nation at that point in time in the verbiage <laughs> of podcasts. 
So I started to actually listen to podcasts as a way to upskill myself at work and, you know, just learn things on the go as one usually does. And very quickly, however, I started to fall down this Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole where I started to replace all of my consumption habits with podcast consumption. I didn't even know when it was happening. It was very subconscious for me. So I started to ditch the newspaper in the morning and I was listening to news related podcasts on my way to work. On my way back from work, I was listening to hobbyist content while at work. I was listening to, you know, self-development, self-growth content. And I was listening to a large amount of true crime and horror content in the evening. I'm also somebody that doesn't like sleeping in silence. So I found podcasts to also be a great aid for that. So I started to sleep with the speakers in my pillow which is not necessarily the most advisable thing to do. And especially if you're married, I can tell you, don't tell your wife that you have this weird quirk until you're married to them. So (laughs) I still do that till today. 14 hours a day, I listen to podcasts. It was basically during this journey of mine, this consumption journey of mine, that a few thoughts and questions started to gnaw on the back of my mind and I wasn't able to shake them off. At the time, this was about 2015-16, podcasting was already a subculture in the world, but you cannot imagine what a subculture it was in India. It was not even a subculture in India. It didn't exist. And I saw that there were a large amount of opportunities and headrooms for this space. So it was, of course, aiding with multitasking, which with people's Dwindling attention spans on the one side and people's, you know, insatiable appetite for content increasing on the other side, it felt like a no brainer that people are going to turn to audio in the days to come. The second thing was that it was passive, it consumed less bandwidth. And then when I started to go a little bit deeper, luckily, I mean, my boss didn't know this at the time, but I started to spend a large amount of my research time where I was supposed to be researching other organizations and other industries. I was researching the podcasting industry at work. Good, my thing. Good use of time. Yes. So I found that from the standpoint of a total addressable market, the podcast market had very strong potential for growth because it had lower barriers of entry in terms of literacy, both on the creator side and the consumer side. It had lower barriers in terms of language, both on the creator side and on the consumer side. And it was a cheaper medium to create in as well as to consume in. But yet there was a discord between the fact that all of this opportunity existed and it felt all rosy and amazing on one side. But then on the other side, you just weren't seeing this growth taking place at all. So I wanted to actually understand this a little bit more. And by this point, I think I reached a slightly unhealthy level of obsession with the medium. So I spoke with my family, incredibly supportive. And I left Barclays and I won't even say to set up Habopper. First year was just exploratory. I was just trying to understand the space. So left Barclays and set up shop at a coffee shop initially, where I created a bunch of alias email accounts so that it looked as though I had a larger team than I had. So I had various different names. And I, as I say, got them fake yeah. it until you make it, fake it until you make it. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was a very beautiful time because I was just spending hours speaking to different people across the industry, across the radio industry, across media conglomerates, across individual creators, across potential listeners, across, I would actually sit in Ubers. This was a really fun experiment where in India, you would actually have um, non-music audio content interspersed with music content on the radio because there are not many radio channels that are there. So you're actually seeing you know, Uber drivers that were listening to what you would call podcast content. And then I would ask them whether they've ever heard the nomenclature podcast and none of them had. And they essentially would shrug me off and, you know, sort of con me off as somebody that was wasting their time. And even when I spoke to people about podcasts, there was always a belief system that people had that it was content that was only meant for the West. And it was essentially content that was not necessarily relatable. And I think a large amount of this is also because of how the name of podcasting came about, which helped the Western market in adoption, but not necessarily the Eastern market. So with the Western market, you saw the word podcast come from the word of iPod and broadcast coming together. And it was an amazing marketing stunt from, well, Apple didn't do it consciously, but essentially it benefited Apple very greatly. 
but from the rest of the world that were more android focused they started to look at the word podcast and they started to associate it with people that had apple devices which came from a very specific demographic of society so they didn't feel that it was necessarily content that, that was meant for them where while at the same time you were looking at this entire populace also being very addicted to storytelling related content listening to religious narratives 24 hours on loop so they had big patterns of consumption in non music audio content but weren't necessarily pinning that along with the word podcast so there was a little bit of confusion with the word and the terminology on one side with understanding what the space was about and then finally i think the biggest problem statement that we found was when we went and started to speak to creators or people that wanted to create in the audio space and just i was appalled and shocked to see how fractured and you know fragmented the creation process was because at least from the creators perspective at that point in 2015 they thought they needed to go to a studio or they needed to purchase equipment at home which cost them money then they needed to go to audacity which would take them a large amount of time or they would give the work to a post production expert who would cost them money then they would need to find something called a hosting platform they didn't know what a hosting platform was which would create a syndicated feed for them they didn't know what a syndicated feed was then they needed to take that syndicated feed and manually go and deposit it into consumption side platforms and ironically all of the consumption side platforms at this time because this was before music platforms had adopted podcasts these were only platforms like your stitcher tune in castbox player.fm etc so their podcast would launch in these platforms but then there would be no uptake for their shows so they'd get no consumption they'd get no analytics they couldn't understand the analytics and they couldn't go to any brands so all of these things sort of taken into you know sort of consideration together it was no surprise to me that while there was opportunity in this space the space wasn't growing because the supply side was choked and the supply side was very fragmented so after bouncing around a little bit what we started to do was we started to try and solve this problem at its core in trying to make the creation process a lot more seamless and try to make the process a little bit more horizontal so that somebody that comes to our platform should be able to if not to 100% degree at least to an 80% degree perform all of the requirements in their podcast journey under one roof itself whether that's hosting whether that's recording whether that's distributing whether that's editing whether that's analytics whether that's getting their embedded players or their micro sites or creating private podcast whatever have you and then we'd aid in a system along that and they could also listen on the platform so that's the thesis through which we were trying to build this trying to limit the fragmentation and very luckily the market picked up on that endeavor and as one often states the market often tells you what it needs so we understood another thing that the market needed in a very dire way which is that the creators needed distribution to platforms that were pertinent to them so we couldn't wait for platforms to go live with podcasts because that would be a very long journey for us so instead we started actually going to platforms that already had content but not podcast content and started to take them live with podcasts so if you're looking at companies today like streaming giants like gana or wink mx player or daily hunt etc etc we took about 15 platforms live with podcasts that never had them before so from the creators perspective they were now being able to host record edit distribute get analytics create marketing collateral all of that but also more importantly they were landing up in front of audiences that were pertinent to them and this was very important from emerging market context yeah so that's pretty much where we're at and it's been a wonderful journey thus far man it's a great journey some questions in my head i love the fact that you know podcasting because of the association to the iphone you were telling me when we were offline that i think it's 98% adoption of android in india yeah and there's a very specific connotation to apple devices in india which is that apple devices are meant for tier 1 city folk that are very fortunate that come from a large amount of privilege etc and android phones are essentially used by well 98% of everybody else so there's also another operating system out in india called kai os and i yeah. think there's a very popular platform called pod lp out there yes there is so we've spoken with the folks at pod lp and 
iOS is basically it was it's been built on the kernel of Android itself and it's been purchased by Jio so that is a very interesting play because there's an entire world of phones called feature phones uh which is somewhere if you think about the phones that we used to have back in the day which are the Nokia phones that we all used to carry around and smartphones and imagine if both of these had a baby that's a feature phone so they have the ability to have very basic applications on them and iOS is basically a very dumbed down version of android and it's growing very rapidly yes so in terms of the platform itself you said it started off with i would have guessed mainly english speaking podcasts but since you've been going about 8 years what is the predominant language has it moved to hindi punjabi gujarati i mean there's so many dialects in the southeast asian community or is it predominantly still english uh no so actually if you are to look at the top languages we have people making content in 22 languages currently on on hubhopper which is quite cool but the top languages are hindi english tamil marathi spanish because we also do have creators from other parts of the world bengali malayalam which is what folks speak in predominantly places like bangalore and and then punjabi would sort of be at the bottom end of this yeah and i would imagine then in terms of saturation india would have most podcasters pakistan bangladesh sri lanka where would they rank against india oh i would say quite a way behind like even if you're looking at our creator breakup today you will see creators from pakistan bangladesh sri lanka but our second highest creator cohort comes from the states after india and i have a thesis on this i think because when we look at our distribution we distribute podcasters to a slew of platforms which they otherwise don't necessarily get access to i think probably creators that are either looking to reach emerging market audiences or diaspora that's sitting in these markets does find hubhopper appealing because they want to reach audiences outside of the usual suspects where we also distribute you to right and so in terms of one question i'd like to ask you we've talked about android phones and feature phones one of the things in the west is we have generally very fast broadband so podcast sizes tend to be quite large we don't really consider having small podcast in terms of you know downgraded audio so that the file size is small is is that file size very critical in india because the phones and the cost of broadband and access is expensive there are two points that are actually add here that's a really good question because it's a layered question on the one side so we distribute about north of what 220000 odd podcast episodes and the average episode length is 16 minutes so it's much shorter than what you'd see in the west and now there are two reasons for this one is because most people on average will have started their consumption journey when they were children by consuming on the radio and in radio as i mentioned uh consumption was very interspersed between music and non music because there are only about 12 radio channels and they're all fighting for the same amount of time so people's consumption habits weren't necessarily in consuming hour long conversational radio which you see in the west over here people were consuming very short you know bursts of content and that's kind of i believe translated when people have moved from offline to online however when you look at broadband as another factor i actually believe india is a is an outlier here because india is the cheapest internet on earth number 1 number 2 it's actually shockingly better in terms of quality than one would imagine in terms of the breadth and what we've seen over the last 4 or 5 years while podcasting has been growing the availability of 4g and 5g capability across india is phenomenal even across tier 2 tier 3 cities but yes i will say that because the general length of an episode is shorter automatically the file size is shorter and because the file size is shorter it's not necessarily that much of a problem so i think the consumption habit has automatically solved this problem statement to quite a large degree 
you talked about short podcasts, but that to me sounds very odd. I understood why from, you know, radio consumption, but India is super famous for Bollywood and three, four hour films. So it seems very odd that you've got, you know, a nation that's used to consuming long form content that then goes to short form content for audio. Oh, that's actually such a good point that you bring up. I think it's because when people consumed audio content, they were used to consuming it in a shorter format. But when people were consuming immersive movie based content, it was meant to be a family experience that everybody went to the cinema hall together and then they enjoyed this hyper reality kind of experience with Bollywood. So they're considered very different in that way in terms of what the consumption experience itself needs to give folks. And you also see people, I'd say, in India consuming in a sort of staggered format. So they'll consume a little bit, then they'll stop. Then they'll come back to the same episode. Then they'll consume a little bit again. Then they'll stop. Then they'll come back again. So that's, I would say, one of the reasons why you'd probably be seeing this. So what are the biggest podcasts in India then? What's number one? What's the genres that are number one? Is there a standout podcast, you know, the Joe Rogan of India? (laughs) So if I was to ask you this question, what do you think it is? Because I think that'll be a fun game. In terms of consumption first, and then I can tell you in terms of creation, what do you think is the highest? I would say spiritual and meditation type podcasting, and then maybe Bollywood related gossip, celebrity podcasting. Um, I'm not sure. As I said, I'm the original coconut. I'm brown on the outside, but white on the inside. I have a very poor knowledge of India and what what culturally is being influenced there. I think you're underplaying yourself because your first initial thought was correct. The top by a long mile in terms of consumption. There is, I mean, it is ridiculous, is religion and spirituality. And anecdotally, everybody knows that Christian sermon podcasts still are among the largest in terms of the number of podcasts being churned out in the world. But in terms of consumption, just the sheer difference between this category and the rest is, I mean, it's earth and moon level difference. And I'll give you an example as to why. So imagine a user base that is coming to platforms to consume one podcast which only has one episode and they'll come and consume that same episode, which is called Hanuman Chalisa. And they'll listen to that same episode for 12 hours and they'll come back the next day and they'll listen to the same episode again for 12 hours without the expectation of a new episode ever coming again. It's such weird. I would say it's such a outlier behavior pattern that exists because these people never want a new season. They never want a new episode. They're very happy with that one episode and that one episode will last them forever. So you're looking at religion and spirituality essentially leading the fray here. Post that comes education and self-development because a lot of people still associate podcasts directly with education and self-development and self-growth. So they're trying to upskill themselves with podcasts. Then comes horror and true crime because I think across the world that's probably a genre that definitely does really well. However, I recently did hear that in Indonesia is one of the only markets on earth in which the true crime genre does not do well at all. I don't know whether this is factual or not, but I heard this anecdotally. After horror comes romance and you can call it light erotica, which is pretty much what does well. Bollywood is very low on this list in terms of uh, consumption. Yeah, it's very low on this list. On the creator side, you will see storytelling content being created the most, interview-based content being created the most, then self-development, self-growth content along with business content. Then you'll see the arts and then comes religion and spirituality in terms of creators creating this content. So if I was to prescriptively ever tell anybody which genre should they create? And if they just wanted to have a successful podcast in terms of downloads, I would say go with religion and spirituality because not too many people are creating it. But if you're creating in it, you're automatically going to be a bestseller. Now, one one of the trends we're seeing in the West certainly is celebrities getting into podcasting. We go from 
Meghan Markle. We got, you know, TV actors and actresses doing very well within the genre. Some people say that the celebrity driven podcast is becoming a bit passe. You know, it's, oh no, you've got a podcast to have, you're an actor or an actress, your agents asked you to do one. But um, again, looking at the Indian or the South Asian diaspora, is the Bollywood actor and actresses who've got massive markets, are they trying to get into podcasting as well? Yes, they are. But I would not say that they're leading the fray. So again, if you look at the West, my favorite podcasters are folks like Aaron Mankey or shows like Case File or Bedtime Stories or How I Built This, etc. And I think a podcast in terms of its longevity is going to be more successful and much more impactful if the person who is creating that show is known because of the podcast itself. The brand of that person is not larger than the podcast. And they came into the world of prominence because of the podcast itself. Now look at Aaron Mankey. He's gone and created books. He's written books. He's created audiobooks. He's got an amazing deal with Amazon. You've got folks like Mr. Ball and similar scenarios. And we've actually got data because we've got celebrities who have created their podcast via Hubhopper. I don't know whether I should be saying this, but because I'm speaking at a slightly more macro level, I think I can say it, it's fair. You'll see a massive consumption spike for the first two, three episodes, which will peter mm-hmm. out. Yeah. And as opposed to, I believe, a much more healthy graph, which would basically be a, like a, not a U-shaped graph, but a graph that's, you know, sort of growing incrementally, but growing steadily month on month, quarter on quarter, year on year. I generally think that those podcasters are, even from a brand's perspective, as well as from an audience's perspective, it's more worth your while and more worth your money. Yeah. I hope I'm not saying something that's very differing from your opinion on this. No, no. I, I, there are a lot of celebrities who get into it who aren't very good and who peter off. I mean, Sarah Ferguson, the princess, uh, the duchess Sarah Ferguson, who was married mm-hmm. to Prince Andrew at one time. She produced a podcast, two, three episodes in. It was awful. I don't think Meghan Markle's has done very well either. But, you know, there are other celebrities who do well and build an audience over time. Um, The one thing you didn't mention was cricket. I'm amazed. As a podcast genre, I would have thought that would carry a lot of weight within the South Asian community. You know, I won't lie in the fact that I'm amazed at times as well. And I wish I had a very quick and sharp retort to tell you why that was, because I personally do not understand why that's not the case. I think maybe it's because of a lack of really well-created shows within the cricket genre. We have, I would say, about 20 odd shows. I'm just giving you a rough estimate that have been created on Hubhopper. They've had good uptick, but... I don't think that there are any call-out shows. Like like if you throw certain categories at me right now, I'll be able to tell you the call-out shows that exist within this subcontinent. But if you throw cricket at me, I can probably share four or five names. And some of these names are, let's say, driven predominantly because they were originals by platforms. So they're, I'm saying podcasts in air quotes because they don't have an RSS feed. So essentially, they're being powered and they're being pushed into the world very aggressively because of those platforms itself. But we would never see those numbers because either platform X or platform Y or platform Z is purchasing this content and is pushing this content out like a Michelle Obama type podcast in which it's marketing right. dollars that is in the growth of the podcast. So in terms of platforms, you know, obviously here in the West, we see Apple, Spotify and now YouTube becoming the dominant players, is that mirrored in India as well? No, no, that is not mirrored actually. And 100% of course is Spotify. Apple Podcasts, no, they would not be in your top five. At least, I mean, I can speak for the 200 or 1,000 episodes that go out from Hubhopper. You'd see in Indian platforms, certain Indian platforms that do very well. In no specific order, platforms like Ghana, Wink, Hangama, you know, these platforms actually do incredible numbers and definitely not platforms to miss. If you're a podcaster, you should definitely think about these platforms because they have less competition on them. They have less creators on them and they have a large amount of users. So it's a nice hotbed where you've got 
less supply and nice healthy amounts of demand. Hmm. Now, one thing I read in podcast daily was the government's cracking down on Google Play Store, much like the EU cracked down on Apple's store with the fees that they're charging. Do you think that Google is going to reduce its fees or do what Apple's done, which is dig its heels in and do the minimum that it has to do in order to comply? I think they will. And again, I can't say for certain, but I'm very fortunate to be part of a few different groups on within the startup ecosystem, which have, I mean, if you are to state the top 100 entrepreneurs of the country who drive change at a government level, these groups essentially have all of those folks. So I would, I am very fortunate to be a passive person within these groups that is able to read this information prior to them coming out in the news. So I read the discussion that they have. I read what they're thinking about as a plan of action to go to the government with. And then three hours later, I'll see an article about what was discussed on that group. <laughs> and it's right. completely surreal to see. And they're a very strong community of folks, Touchwood. Touchwood for every entrepreneur in this ecosystem. And they're all together driving change. Each of them is very powerful in their own right. And when they come together, they're an iron fist. I cannot state in any scenario that I am a strong contributor in this. I am passive on this Rolodex of, you know, Goliaths. But that being said, uh, I, I definitely believe Google will have to make certain changes. They already have, in fact. They've had to backtrack a little bit. So they removed many of the major applications, I think three weeks ago from the Google Play Store. And there was a massive uproar because the folks that you're removing these applications from, it's not because of any, I'm not saying that they're not to be trifled with for any other reason other than the fact that they built the startup ecosystem. And you're talking about the startup ecosystem in one of the most active startup ecosystems on earth today, which is India. So by unceremoniously removing all of them without letting them know from these platforms, I don't think it's justified at all. And then they pretty much weren't conversing for a little bit of time until government intervention also came in and now they've reinstated those platforms back. They've come up with a half-baked solution to solve problems. But I definitely do believe that there will be a point in which, you know, sort of a nice middle path or mid-ground will be reached. Because I don't think it's fair for innovation. I think these companies, some of whom are very fortunate to be on very large margins, some of whom aren't fortunate, aren't operating on such large margins. It's It does a major disservice towards innovation. So I definitely believe that a middle ground has to be reached. Last couple of questions then, Gautam. How do podcasters monetize their content in India? That's a phenomenal question. And I actually, when I was at the Indie Pod Corner, when I was at PodFest, this is one of the questions I pose to podcasters in the West often. And whenever I'm speaking with podcasters in the West, and I always thought that the answer would be different than what I hear from with podcasters in India, but it's actually not that different. And what we prescribe to folks is to not put all of your eggs in one monetization basket. So if you've got four or five different methodologies, there are about what? five, six or different methodologies to monetize your podcast, whether that's host street ads or whether that's programmatic or whether that's you selling merchandise from your podcast to using affiliate links or let's say hypothetically you doing live shows or a couple of other direct and indirect ways, your Patreon methodologies or locking your episodes with private podcasts or another format. I think what at least we tell podcasters is to take two or three of them and a basket of monetization methods according to the show genre that you're in. And then according to that, you should devise a monetization strategy instead of putting all of your hopes and eggs in one basket. So if you are a pop culture show, then you should play on getting a host, getting a host read campaign potentially, which is not as active as in the West as it is in the East, unfortunately, because it's not as organized of a market. On the second side, you should be focusing on merchandising and you should be focusing on something like patronage. However, if you are a business acumen related podcast that is teaching people something invaluable, which may aid them because it's content that would otherwise be locked in that scenario, you can have a private podcast version of your specific podcast 
you should have a Patreon element to your podcast and you can have a hosted ad. So it depends from podcaster to podcaster. I would love to hear your opinions on this as well. I think overly monetizing a podcast is unattractive for the listener. But if you do it in two or three different ways that are strategic, it actually both increases your overall quantum that you can monetize, but at the same time, it de-risks you. So you leverage across a couple of different things at once. But I would love to hear your thoughts on this too. Well, my thoughts differ from James slightly. I think the West has relied on downloads as a metric, which I think is the emperor's new clothes. I think it's a complete falsehood, I think, in terms of mm-hmm. downloads don't equal listens, don't equal play. Oh, so okay. I think we've yeah. been telling advertisers, oh, I've got X thousand downloads. And then Apple came in and removed most of those downloads because they were just auto downloads and people started mm-hmm. moaning that their download numbers were halved and advertisers then said, well, oh, you said you had 10,000, you've only got 3,000 and, you know, mm-hmm. the numbers all dropped and everyone was moaning. And it was like, well, yeah, the emperor's new clothes have been found out. It, 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 this, you know, advertising model is not what it was. And I think, you know, I always argue that if I was a company wanting to advertise in podcasting, I wouldn't feel confident because, you know, if my ad was number three in the list of a show, so pre, post, mid, uh, I, I wouldn't be confident that anyone listened to it. And I've asked numerous people about their podcasting behavior and more than often it's oh yeah as soon as i hear the ad i skip it as soon as i hear the ad skip and yeah, yeah so so as an advertiser if i was doing it, i'd be like oh so you can't tell me really how many people listened you can't tell me if my ad was actually listened to and more often than not i probably guess that most people will skip my ad but hey i'll give you some money for your podcast so i think advertising has a massive change to come and that there are a lot of ideas around, you know, time listened, percent completed, Mm -hmm. uh, value paid, which, you know, again, is a very early model about relating to micropayments and Bitcoin. But, you know, even if you just had time listened and percent completed, that would be better than downloads. And I think on top of that, I think, there are other models coming along in the future that will come that will be better for advertisers. But right now, I think it's what we have. James will tell you it's the model that exists. That's all we have today. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater and, you know, just poo-poo downloads. But I think if the industry is to grow, I think we need to change and we need to add value back to advertisers who feel then that there is a true value in promoting it. I think host red ads, and we're seeing one of the big networks in America called Twit this week in tech with Leo Laporte. They're famously being host red ads and they're struggling madly now because of programmatic and dynamic ad insertion and all these other types of formats, which they don't want to take on board. They feel that's a very different model to theirs. And of course, um, advertisers just want to do this at scale rather than do host red ads, which aren't at scale. So I think that's another challenge. And fundamentally, I also think with the way that advertising is going, we, we, we don't have the right reporting tool. So the IAB, again, I don't think provides the right support to podcasters. So I think we've got a massive problem. And I think CPM rates, although they've remained fairly steady on growing massively, and I think sponsor-related podcasts really only appear at the top of the the list. You know, the big podcasts get the sponsors and the big advertisers, but at the bottom, the long tail, I think people still struggle. Although I think there's okay. great value in the long tail because you've got a very focused, dedicated audience. Even if you've got 50 people listening to your podcast, you know, mm-hmm. it's clearly 50 people in a genre that an advertiser specific advertiser might want to reach. Last thing to, to, to ask you, one of the things you and I have been talking about offline is the idea of podcasting 2.0 and the next generation of podcasting. Now, you have already started to add some podcasting 2.0 tags to Hubhopper. What have you been working on? Yeah, so we have about seven, I think, right now. So we have, you know, the generic ones, we have funding, we have GUID for episode, we have episode, 
itself. So in total, about seven that we have out right now. And definitely want to play around with getting a bunch more in the days to come. I keep reading about Podcast 2.0 and definitely find it incredibly exciting. And I think it's super exciting, the couple of things that you were mentioning. One of the tags I was wondering whether you supported was the transcript tag, which clearly Apple's now popularized across the mass market. It's been there for probably about a year or so in the Podcasting 2.0 apps, but now suddenly with Apple adopting it, it's suddenly everyone's gone, oh, transcriptions, they're a great idea. Do you have transcriptions within Hubhopper? Yes, we do. Yes. Because I would have seen the multiple languages that you have, that would be quite essential really yeah and you can also create transcripts for your show within hub opera itself so what we've tried to do one of the endeavors that we keep doing because this is something that podcasters in india definitely need and in emerging markets is they need their turnaround times to get shorter so wherever we see an opportunity for turnaround times to get shorter we try and jump in there so whether that's actually in filling of the information in the rss itself whether that's in leveraging AI for that to make things a little bit quicker there, whether that's in the creation of their cover art. Right now, we have an integration with Canva, whether that's in the creation of their show notes that we're using the transcription for, and whether that's also in the creation of their episode titles and going forth from there, creating social collaterals. So we both create their transcript and we also have the transcript tag out. But once again, I think offline we were seeing that we haven't necessarily pushed a few of these into podcast index so looking yeah. to do that request soon so the ones that we have right now are also locked podcast guid episode guid license funding so these ones are there excellent so it's good to see that you're growing that i mean there's obviously about i think 30 tags so you know there's room for growth as they say there Gotham, thank you so much for your time. I mean, it's been fascinating hearing about your personal story, but also the growth of podcasting in India as well. So thank you so much. No, thank you so much for your time and thank you for the opportunity. I've truly enjoyed this a lot and look forward to speaking with you both online and offline once again. People News on the Pod News Weekly Review. So jumping into uh, people news, Jordan Fox has been named as the CEO of Ad Results Media. He's uh, joined from a creative and digital agency called Laundry Service. Ad Results Media is a pretty big uh, podcast buying uh, company that um, claims to have been the first uh, podcast um, ad company to have um, bought ads on podcasts, which is um, quite a thing. Um, events and awards. The shortlist has been announced for the New York Festival's Radio Awards, uh, also the Arias in the UK. Uh, the nominations have been announced for that too. And of course, the Ambies were given out uh, this week. Did you go to the American Podcast Awards? Uh, I didn't thought go to the American Podcast Awards. Uh, no, um, but uh, you can watch uh, the Ambies uh, in full. Um, on uh, their their website, um, which was uh, good. Podcast of the year ended going to Slow Burn from uh, Slate Podcast. They did a, um, a, a show all about becoming Justice Thomas, um, the uh, the justice, uh, the judge who um, seems to be taking money from uh, all kinds of people. Um, so that was good. Uh, one of the things I did notice um, is that um, a podcast called Wait for It. Uh, which is apparently best indie podcast, although it was hosted by PRX, um, that um, ended up winning three awards. So that was the most awarded um, show from OX Big Ron Studios. Never heard of it, but um, it seems to have done very well. Um, so there's a full list of that on the Pod News website. Uh, the next big event to go to is the podcast show, which is in London uh, at the end of May. I've heard there's a very good keynote right at the beginning of that. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And exciting gossip about a big party. I can tell you the exciting gossip. It's all gone a bit Pete Tong. Oh, no. Pete Tong is the DJ. Wow. Or the uh, Spreaker and... Um, now, who is it? Spreaker and somebody else. Probably a cast. It usually is. Yeah. It's with Spreaker and Triton Digital. That's 
Triton Digital. Uh, yes, so uh, the party in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the conference. Uh, Pete Tong will be the DJ, which is. Is he going to actually play some music? Unlike Paris Hilton, who who just stood behind some decks the last time. I I I have no idea how how a music DJs work. So quite. I possibly. thought you were one. <laughs> <laughs> not not one of those. I did go to a. I did go to a um, yeah to a, a, a nightclub once, um, but uh, I basically told the DJ who was in there, just play some songs. I'll just talk over it and give give the sponsor a couple of credits, and right. every, everybody so, will. So at this point, can I ask you to reveal because you did mention it on stage your DJ name? I, I was called James Andrews. Oh, there you go. And I, Google James Andrews. Nobody could. Uh, yes, nobody could. Uh, anyway, um, Podfest Asia has been announced, uh, which is going to be in Manila in the Philippines, uh, and uh, which uh, is happening on May the eighth, and uh, plenty more uh, events to come, including uh, Podcast Day Asia, which is happening at the beginning of September. Uh, more events, both paid for and free, of course, at PodNews. Um, PodNews.net slash events is the place to go. The tech stuff, tech stuff on the Pod News Weekly Review. Yes, it's the stuff you'll find every Monday in the Pod News newsletter. Here's where we do all of the tech talk. Here's where Sam talks technology. Uh, what have we got here, Sam? Well, um, I saw this story you wrote from Eric Nance about creating a podcast index data dashboard. I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. I went and had a look at it, and I'm totally flummoxed as to what it's actually telling me, <laughs> because it's basically saying a couple of things fail, a couple of things duplicated, and I was like, oh, okay, no, not that interesting. No, I think it's a tool to spot duplicates in the data, other data issues and things like that. It's um, done by somebody that uses the R stat software um, to, to do other things, and I think it was a good piece of work from him. Um, I think it's going to be very helpful to get rid of the duplicates in the podcast index because there are quite a lot of them. Um, So from that point of view, super useful for mere humans to have a look at it. Possibly not quite as useful, but um, yeah, but it's a nice thing to end up seeing anyway. Um, So that's all pretty cool. And um, yes, uh, you've been talking to all kinds of people, haven't you? Yeah, sorry. That's that's, that's my problem. Now, I... I (laughs) Obviously, we had uh, uh, Eric Prodomo on a couple of weeks back talking about activity pub and his new book. Yes. And I think it's beginning to catch on to Adam and Dave. I listened to the Friday Night Show and I, I had, had myself braced for uh, a criticism from Adam, followed by praise nearly, nearly praise. Well. I know, it turned around in the space of 10 minutes um, from, oh, that's Sam Seth Eaton. Oh, this might be interesting. Yes, I did. I did hear that. I did hear that. He sounded, uh, yeah... Um, I mean, I think uh, the big question that he was asking is, where does all of this data get stored? And we have an answer now. Oh, do we have an answer now? What's the answer? So Mr. John Spurlock, who's a super smart person, and I decided to sit down and, and try to thrash it through. So, yes. Step one is we've created the activity stream. Step two, we will publish that to your personal client of like Mastodon, for example. Okay. Right. So. You know, James listed to this, you tell, you put it into your master client and anyone who follows you gets to see it and then can click on any activity yeah. back. Elton, I can see it because we're all using the same social interact tag endpoint that the creators declared for that episode. And do I get uh, Daniel J. Lewis very concerned about um, wanting control yeah. of the comments and stuff like that? Does he get the so control? You get two controls. So in true fans, for example, I think I talked about it a couple of weeks ago, we've created an ability to say what verbs will be published. Yeah. It's not auto-publishing anyway, uh, unless you choose to auto-publish. Yeah. So that's your first control. And then the second control is you are the owner of that social interact tag because it's in your own client. Right. If you so wish, you can just delete a comment there or delete the whole post. Right, right. So I think, okay. look, it's not fully baked out and it's not fully formed, but I think there's the semblance of an idea that's being formed. I think it's worth pushing a little further. Well, worthwhile um, taking a peek at. It sounds as if you're on the, as you call it, the Friday Night Show, the yep. Podcasting 2.0 uh, podcast, Adam and Dave. Um, April 19th, it says here. So um, they've clearly got... Uh, a set of exciting guests coming up. Oh, for me then. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be. I've got. You're going to be space. on space. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And also, if you want to listen to Daniel and I talk about more in depth about podcast, 
activity streams and the activity pub and the potential use of it. I listen to the last episode of the Future of Podcasting. Yeah, worth a listen. Boostergram. Boostergram Corner. 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 On the Pod News Weekly Review. Oh, yes, it's our favorite time of the week. Uh, it's Boostergram Corner. Uh, Sam and I share all of the boosts that we get from this. Um, if you don't see a boost button in your podcast app, then uh, you should be getting a new one at podcasting2.org. Uh, we've got two. Um, uh, uh, one from Andrew Grummet, who we both met, didn't we? Mm. He, he is part of podcasting history. Uh, the man who uh, who uh, coded up um, iPodder that was then very quickly changed its name to uh, Juice Podder, I think. Yes. Um, yes, after a, <laughs> after a cease and desist from Apple. Um, but he was super cool, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. We, we ended up having, having, having some food with him, and uh, yeah, that was nice. I'm a little worried about what he's doing now with space rockets, but other than that, <laughs> <laughs> yes. from podcasting to space rockets, that's that's quite a leap. Yes. Um, that's, but yeah, that's his main job. So he sent us a row of ducks two 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 saying cringy AI tunes for the win. Oh, I think yes. he liked your uh, your tune that we did for us. Yes, that was uh, that was almost as bad as the one that Todd Cochran is now using on the on the front of the new media show. Uh, which is just awful, just <laughs> awful. Um, so yeah, really good to have met you, uh, Andrew, and good luck with uh, with the uh, <laughs> good luck with the space technology. Yeah, he's coming on. Uh, we've got a date booked, so he's coming on the show shortly. Cool. Uh, well, that should be good. And uh, ten thousand sats from Adam Curry. Uh, he uh, he's clarifying, of course, that the value for value model doesn't require any particular payment technology so crypto and things like that aren't necessarily not the bitcoin is crypto but you get that kind of thing anyway uh, he's saying that uh, it doesn't require any particular payment technology all it requires is an ask uh, no agenda has pioneered it and done it for 16 years adam says just with paypal and leo laporte because we were mentioning that last week leo laporte needs to get over the mental block of asking uh, also Adam adds, I think it's a little catty. Also, you need a quality product. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you, uh, Adam. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, you, you can ask for uh, pounds and dollars uh, just as easily as you, as you can ask for Bitcoin and sats and uh, everything else. So um, what has, else has been happening for you this week, uh, Sam? Uh, well been here at the uh podcast movement evolutions i really enjoyed it meeting everybody who um you know we generally talk to remotely um one of my personal successes i think is getting three or four hosts now to commit to using the alternative enclosure i'm really pleased i've been banging that drum for a while so i yeah. feel that's now the pennies dropped um and the other one is i'm going to be the new evangelist for the podcast standards project are you Oh, well, there you go. Well, that'll be fun. Well, Podcast I, Standards Project. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, so, so you've got no work to do because they haven't done anything in, in years. Have yeah, they? that's it. Well, I, I, I spoke to Ben and Alberto and I spoke to Mark and I spoke to Todd and I said, look, um, none of you are actually doing anything with this, really, because none of you take ownership of it. Yeah. And I said, it fundamentally needs somebody. Now, I, I gave them a year ago a couple of names to throw into the hat yeah. and nothing came of it. Yeah. And I said, look, I fundamentally do the job anyway, within reason, through what we do here at yeah. Odd News and what I do for my own self with True Fighters. So why don't I sort of take a more formal role of doing it and come up with a plan of how we can progress this further? So, yeah, that's a little announcement for you, James. Well, very cool. That's, well, that's exciting. Um, so you can learn more about the Podcast Standards Project at podstandards.org. Um, I think, to, to be fair, it's been quite quiet over the last um, year or so. Um, there are six podcast hosting companies who are in there. Um, there are six um, podcast players who are in there. And they've Who's got pod a, fans? I don't know that one. And they've got, oh, yes, it still says pod fans. Oh dear, um, and there's a very good media partner on on there as well. It would be lovely to um, see a little bit more uh, movement and action. So the fact that you are going to be involved with that um, is uh, really good. And uh, and, and in fact, um, there is I happen to know a podcast standards project meeting in 25 minutes. Mm, wonder where I've got to get to. I wonder wonder where I've got to get to too. So exactly. uh, yes, yeah, so that should be fun. Um, so excellent news. Um, it's uh, nice to uh, see that uh, happening. So what's happened for you, James? Well, I've been all over the place uh, since we last spoke. Where did I last speak to you? Oh, we were in Munich, weren't we? Yes. Yeah, so I went to uh, Oslo earlier on in the in the week, where um, 
my bags uh, stayed for uh, some considerable amount of time. Um, and um, uh, buy an air tag. That's what I would say. If you are doing any travel, stick an air tag in your luggage uh, because you can then tell the airline, as I did, where your bag is when they lose it. So uh, there's a thing. Then I uh, spoke at Radio Days Europe, um, which had a podcasting summit and other uh, things such as that. And uh, yeah, so that's been fun. And then, of course, um, flying here, I ended up going to the Griffith Observatory, oh, really? which overlooks yeah overlooks LA. And it's a rather, rather a lovely place. Did you get far? Did you go on the swing? I didn't go on the swing. I don't There's even know what you're talking about. Swing up there. The yeah, and sit on it. It's on in between the trees. It's an old swing. Oh yeah, and you can literally it takes you off the edge and then back. Oh, that sounds that sounds like something that my travel insurance would not allow. We're be doing that, and I'm looking forward to uh, flying home. I'm flying home on Saturday, so this time next week we'll be back into our normal, quiet studio setups instead of in this uh, relatively noisy um, room but there we go and uh, that's it for this week thank you to gotham um for being our guest earlier on you can also listen to the pod news daily subscribe to the pod news newsletter for more of these stories and much much more you'll find out at podnews.net and you can give feedback to james and i by sending this show at boostergram if you don't have a podcast app that supports boost then grab a new app from podcasting2.org forward slash apps our music is from studio dragonfly our voiceover is sheila d we're hosted and sponsored by buzzsprout podcast hosting made easy get updated every day subscribe to our newsletter at podnews.net tell your friends and grow the show and support us and support us the pod news weekly review will return next week keep listening